folks, Joseph A. Sabori here. Today is Christmas, the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> yeah. It's also the beginning of the birth of Jesus Christ and the day that Santa finally gets to relax with Mrs. Claus and the rest of the elves in the North Pole on, on his workshop. Yeah, so now they can have a Christmas party and everything. <laughs> and then they can open their own gifts, too. Yeah. But so is the rest of the family and friends, relatives, and neighbors, all around the world. <laughs> yeah. Because yesterday, I had a great uh, Christmas Eve uh, dinner. You know, I just had some turkey. Yeah, with some stuffing and and sauce. I know sometimes you know, they get dry, but it always gets better and better once you pour in the sauce and everything, and it'll taste just right. Yeah. Uh, joining them with some nice, delicious um, pumpkin pie uh, for desserts, or or some cheesecake. Maybe even pecan pie. I did actually have some um, one of the desserts that I got from Porto's. I, I love those uh, those croissants that they got, and I even had those uh, potato balls too, which I guess it could have been a lot better, but that's okay. I mean, it always will get better anytime. And I did have some bread rolls and. Even the potato salad, rice, uh, cucumber salad, but a drink, of course. <laughs> and we got some gifts, too. I mean, we did send out all the gifts to our family, but we also got our gifts, too. And I might show it uh, later on. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, post it on my Instagram that goes straight into Facebook, so you'll show what I got is I post photos there too <laughs> as you may know and um, I know they got it as well too and I thought for this particular season I didn't think I was going to do another movie review to end it this way because I wanted to end it with Scrooge you know the Albert Finney movie and a classic for sure and the perfect role to play Ebenezer Scrooge and yes I guess I forgot that one line that I should have added in my review I know I I always forget sometimes <laughs> um, free spirits more like free humbugs <laughs> yeah before he was ready to go to bed when one o'clock appears <laughs> yeah Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just getting ahead of myself. All right, I will do that later because I got some great gifts to to show you. And one of them, of course, uh, is the T-shirt that I got. My brand new uh, Avengers shirts. It says Earth's uh, Mightiest Heroes, and there's this uh, Japanese proverb here. It says Avengers, and yeah, you can see Iron Man, along with Thor, Black Panther, and Captain America. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I love superheroes, and I'm always never going to get tired of it. Okay? At least I'm a person who's sane. Right? Yes, I go on the internet too, as everyone else has. But I don't go completely nuts, like I'm ready to go to the insane asylum. No. Or at least I can, I mean, I get excited sometimes, yeah. But at least I think about something else, too. Okay, well, let's not think of that, which that's exactly how this is going to go for, for lunacy. Well... Speaking of which, 
Um, I'm going to review the Pinanio Christmas Favorite that came out on June 11th, 1947. It's the original holiday classic, Miracle on 34th Street, which is actually known as the Big Hearts in the UK, but it's always going to be this title. A story about which takes place in New York City between Thanksgiving and Christmas, focusing on this jolly old man named Chris Kringle, who ends up working at Macy's department store, you know, taking his place as Santa Claus, but he claims he might be the real thing. And that's some phony, some in-store Santas around here and there that we get, <laughs> or any other Santas all around the city, many places and all, and ones that does charities and other events, but that's okay. You know, they're doing a good world job here. Yes. Always been a classic, for sure. I remember watching this as a kid. Uh, they often played this on TV uh, during Christmas time, or sometimes they played in December, or they end up playing it uh, in late November. Uh, NBC had played this like after the Macy's uh, Thanksgiving parade, so this seemed like a tradition. But they also had played this uh, in syndication. Uh, during the time, like in the 80s and 90s, and they often played the black and white version, but then later they played the color version, which doesn't quite fit the tone through its uh, time period, because the movie just looks better in black and white, the way it was filmed and shot. I mean, they had to use computers just taking the black and white image of the film source and they just they just put some digital ink and paint they had to f do anything to keep all these flesh tones on all the actors and the characters that they played and they had to change um, the setting what it's supposed to look like you know like the chairs or you know the courtroom scenes here and there it, because it usually has a gold brown color I mean the chair of course was like a little bit gold brownish and then but on the back it's like a green inside and then you know they try to make the Christmas tree look as green and realistic this way and and the rest of the the parades and all that it just doesn't fit and to this day it's it doesn't work that way I know with digital technology they can try to improve that to make it look like this was shot in color but I sense that that's what they're trying to do, but it still looks cheap because you can still spot some errors. They can fix that, but it's you can still see, you know, some of the errors that's going around, like the eyes, um, the mouth too. It almost looks like like someone smoking. So you see all these uh, all this black, and sometimes their lips doesn't quite match. So. The reason why they did this uh, back in the 80s and 90s was because uh, they wanted to go for a different generation. They want everything to look and feel like color is the most common thing ever. Like they they weren't so sure how how black and white was going to be treated. It's such a trend, and I'm sorry. It would always be the original film source. Black and white is the key. That was common from the golden eras of, of films. It just stay that way. Okay? And sometimes they use black and white in today's movies too. And sometimes they can even use it in other films that they could. Just didn't need that. So that's for sure. Now I know when they did shot this, uh, yes, it was during the Macy's Finks giving day parade that was going around and they were shooting this live but they're hoping to get some particular scenes that twines uh, 
with the film. Like we want to get shots of some of the uh, parades that they show and also to get a, a nice glimpse of it while they're at the apartments where we see um, uh, Susan along with Fred you know, while they're just um, sitting around just watching it for sure and then they're just talking about um, the myths of Santa Claus like they're not so sure if if it's real or not yeah I mean th this brings a story of conflict and and sentimentalism about um, you know truthful and common sense like some people would believe for sure but they thought all this is a fairy tale so that's why they just want to they want to stay for where they are until who knows yeah so they must have taken a lot of time, you know, shooting the scene, and even though it was really cold that day and all, as, as they claim, uh, coming from Maureen O'Hara, the actress, in her memoirs, I mean, it was, she quoted that it was a bitterly cold that day, and, and Edmund and I, yeah, Edmund Gwen, who's the, the role of uh, Chris Kringle in the movie, and she envied uh, Natalie Wood, yeah, who played Susan, and John Payne, who played uh, Fred. Uh, yeah, they were watching the parade from the window. <laughs> so they had to take some time. Um, also, originally, because um, they wanted to get this right on schedule, they were going to release this in May uh, before they were going to release it later in June. So this was like the summertime. I mean, they probably could have released it in November, but I know they wanted to take some time. So that way it becomes a hit, for sure. Oh, and, um, and while this is based on the story by Valentine Davies, um, for sure, this movie um, actually was um, nominated for Academy Awards and it actually won free uh, for Best Actor in the Supporting Role for Edmund Gwynn and Valentine Davies for Best Writing and of course George Seaton who also directed this movie but um, it was almost going to win for Best Picture but lost to a Gentleman's Agreement um, yeah which is a, a movie with Gregory Peck Dorothy McGuire and John Garfield. Although I would definitely say Miracle on 34th Street should have won. Because that's a better movie. <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, that's a, that should be a great film too. I mean, they're all, we had a lot of great films in that period. And I'm sure there were bad films too, but that's alright. It's part of the era of of many movies that we got for cinema. Yep. And there have been remakes of this. Uh, there was the 1955 version. Then there was the the 70s version with uh, Sebastian Cole you know, from Family Affair. And then next, the 1994 version that John Hughes wrote and produced, uh, which had um, Richard Attenborough you know, from Jurassic Park, and I know he's done a lot of work. You know, he he had directed movies too, and um, they have Merle Wilson from Mrs. Doubtfire, and Matilda, that's her, and it had Elizabeth Perkins from Big, and the Flintstones, that actress, yeah, yeah, she played Wilma Flintstone that that year. And Dylan McDermott uh, from Hardware and In the Line of Fire. He later went on to do the TV show The Practice. Um, that was on ABC. And what do you know? Because he played a lawyer in that show. Kind of an inspiration to the lawyer he played in that version. <laughs> yeah. And I thought it was a 
I thought it was a great remake. I mean, despite of some issues here and there, and I know they had to do some changes, but that's okay. Uh, I can live with that. The performances are just terrific on that version. But you can never top the original movie because their performances is totally delightful, caring, and very strong. And it's not that serious either. It's uh, it's very joyful, a feel-good movie too. But there are some a little bit of dark moments, just a little bit, not too much. But anyway, let's start just so we can keep it up. It stars Marwin O'Hara, uh, John Payne, Evan Gwynn, Gene Lockhart. Natalie Wood, Porter Hall, William Frawley, yes, William Frawley, uh, before he went on to play uh, the next door neighbor and best friend, uh, Fred Mertz from Isle of Lucy, <laughs> yes, um, which is indeed Lucy and Ricky's uh, pal, join in with uh, Ethel Mertz, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jerome uh, Cohen, Philip Baton, and then there's some actors who are uncredited for the roles. Uh, they got Jack Alberson, uh, who of course went on to do Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and the TV show Chico and the Man, among others he's done. Uh, Harry uh, Antrim, Leela Bliss, Jeff Corey, Mary Field, William Forrest, uh, Alvin Greenman. Who would later be in a remake from 1994, of course. Theresa Harris, uh, Percy Helton, Herbert Hayes, Robert uh, Carnes, uh, Snuff Pollard, Thelma Ritter, and James T.A. Its story is written by Valentine Davies, joining in with George Seaton, who wrote and directed this film. The movie began said in New York City, we meet our jolly old man, nice and gentle, very kind, also smart and intelligent, named Chris Kringle, who's played by Edward Gwynn, who of course has a long, full, white beard, whiskers and all, <laughs> and very real, you know, with a top hat. And a walking cane just wandering around um, throughout the entire uh, city going through several of the places where he eventually he just um, spotted the shop owner who was decorating um, all the Christmas stuff including setting up all the reindeers um, for the North Pole of course <laughs> but unfortunately Chris had to give him the advice that he actually had set it up wrong. He made a mistake, so he actually fixed it. I mean, he wasn't going to buy anything for sure because his, the store was already closed on Thanksgiving Day. Yeah. And while we're at it, he was walking around the street where he was dignified to find that the man who was assisted to play Santa Claus in the annual Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade is intoxicated, you know, drinking booze while he was getting ready to go on the sleigh with the rest of the reindeers, as we all know of, of their names. Yeah. <laughs> and also to practice the whip, too. <laughs> so, at that rate, he complains to the event director, Doris Walker, played by Maureen O'Hara, that this could definitely be insulting and definitely, indeed, um, well, scarred them for life for sure. So she persuades uh, Chris to take his place, and if he succeeds, he'll be hired to play Santa in the Macy's New York City store on 34th Street. And indeed he did, for sure. <laughs> yes. And while the parade was going on, we meet attorney Fred Galley, who's played by John Payne, who's Doris's neighbor, and he takes uh, 
the young divorcee's daughter, uh, Susan, who's played by Nally Wood. Yeah, just to to watch the parade by the window. Uh, unfortunately, though, they are non-believers because they thought this whole thing is a myth for sure. In fact, uh, Fred actually told uh, Susan that she doesn't believe in fairy tales either. So apparently he got that from her mother because I guess when she was a little girl she knew about it. But then as years gone by, maybe she just lost her trust, decided to become more truthful and use common sense. You know, to make sure you know everyone become like a better person in their own uh, beliefs. Yeah. So therefore, while Chris was working at Macy's as Santa Claus, um, he was ignoring all the instructions from the toy department head, which was uh, Mr. Julian Shellhammer, played by Philip Tung, to recommend overstock items. Uh, to undecided shoppers around because you know they do go to all these department stores in New York yeah there's like tons of them and they thought it'd be nice if if maybe if they if they don't have any of the items uh, that each of their their kids um, requests that they got like if they're not available at the Macy's store then maybe they'll find a way to actually work a plan which at this rate Chris directs one woman to another store to fulfill her son's Christmas request to see if maybe all these department stores will be able to send out all of those gifts straight to the store and maybe soon they'll become a loyal customer for Macy's so yes this woman was so the impressed by Chris's honesty and healthiness that it actually informed that she actually really informed Showhammer that that she'll become the customer for sure and he'll be able to go to the store as soon as they can and Showhammer was very surprised and shocked about this uh, therefore uh, Fred took uh, Susan to see Santa and this is where it comes to their amazement, since they are non-believers. Was Susan was uh, very uh, surprised when she actually met uh, Chris and telling um, him that you may not be the real Santa for sure. Well, he claimed that he is by actually showing his entire beard and. She noticed that it's real and actually have him, you know, touch it to make sure. <laughs> and when she touches it on his chin, it's, and he says, ouch, from his long beard. Yeah, that's the most famous scene that's ever shown in this entire movie. And you'll never forget that scene. But another great scene uh, in the case was when Susan was very shaken when he spotted Quiz uh, talking to this Dutch girl because she doesn't know any English for sure so apparently he actually spoke Dutch to that girl to his, to her amazement it was it was really uh, incredible so Doris asked Kringle to tell Susan that he might not be Santa, but he insisted that he is. Which, that led her to be very worried because even when he, she spotted um, his identification card to see where he was from, and then they begin to spot that he has all the reindeers, through their names so that's where she plans to fire him despite the fact that he used his generosity and much more positivity with publicity and goodwill that the store owner 
Yeah, R.H. Macy, played by Henry Atram, was offering them bonuses for a good world job. But to leave Doris's misgivings going around, um, that's where she hired uh, Granville Sawyer, played by Porter Hall, to actually examinate uh, Chris, for sure. Yeah, which is this rate, a psychological evaluation. But recommends Chris's dismissal and hoping that, you know, he'll still be able to work at Macy's as Santa as long as, you know, things can go well. Uh, now, meanwhile, at, at the apartment, um, you know, just to, you know, just to take care of things and all. You know, Chris stayed over, you know, just to see how everything's going to work out. Yeah, just taking care of, of Susan and, and all the rest. We began to find out that Susan uh, eventually did not ask for what she wants um, while they were at the store. But it turns out that what she really wants as an excellent Christmas gift was when she showed... Uh, Chris, a magazine photo of a dream house that's somewhere in New York and tells him that's exactly what she wants for Christmas. But reluctantly, he'll do whatever he can. Because who knows? I mean, it's a hard bargain, but he's going to do it for sure. If not, then who knows? But it's a deal and a secret to plan if he will be indeed Santa. Yeah. Okay. And <laughs> then in the company's uh, cafeteria, we meet a young employee, Alfred, who's played by Alvin Greenman, who tells Chris that, well, you know, because he does you know, work as an in-store Santa, too, and he's also a janitor as well. He tells that Sawyer convinced him that he's unstable simply because he was too kind-hearted, for sure. That's where Chris got humidly furious and decided to go all the way to, to confront Sawyer and tell him to, to bring back his job and tried to, to fix this problem, but he refused and decided to eventually strike him on the head with the umbrella, leaving him a huge bump on his forehead. And then suddenly, Chris is being sent to Bellevue Hospital, which I know they're going to give him his examination, but he failed to do so. And at this rate, um, he was being recommended to a permanent commitment. So Fred came, you know, be able to defend him for sure, to, to make everyone believe that he is Santa. So now they had a courtroom trial where we meet the Honorable Judge Henry X. Harper, who's uh, played by Gene Lockhart. And they also got the district attorney, Thomas Mara, who's played by Jerome Coran, who had to get Chris to insist that he is Santa Claus and to rest his case. But asking Harper to rule that Santa does not exist for sure. But uh, Henry does... But Harper, on the other hand, does have a political advisor named Charlie O'Haran, who's played by William Frawley, yeah, with, with the cigar in his mouth, but warns him that it will be disastrous to for his upcoming uh, re-election bid. Yeah, like, I think he's, he's the mayor, for sure. So Harper had to buy some time to see if, if they can try to, to win the case for sure, 
So Fred is definitely doing his best to defend Chris that he is indeed the real Santa. And this is where it leads to all these other scenes that we got. Like he actually brought in <laughs> uh, Thomas's uh, son to join to actually explain is Chris um, real and indeed he is about what he got for Christmas and just to know the truth which I thought it was very funny because <laughs> because this is this is exactly what Thomas had in mind when he was just trying to well I guess at this rate told a fib on on his own son thinking that Santa does exist for sure but well that seems sort of an embarrassment for him <laughs> that was a funny moment but at that rate um, as the next trial uh, appears um, just to finally um, win the case well guess what uh, that's where everyone started to send out all the letters to Chris straight to the courtroom and that also includes um, Susan because he wrote a letter to him on the promise that he'll take and hoping to believe and then later Doris uh, wrote uh, this one letter the same letter but just wrote just one tiny message at the end and then it got sent um, you do meet at the post office you meet uh, the mail sorter named Al played by Jack Alberson so you'll notice that's him and that's where he got the letter and then next thing you know the entire post office team uh, had plenty of sacks of mail all addressed to Chris Kringle to know the truth that he is indeed Santa Claus yes everyone was like taking out a whole load of sacks and they just dumped it straight into the eponium <laughs> of the judge like tons of them yeah straight to where the gavel is and, and all <laughs> and now they proclaim that he is indeed Santa and now he's gonna get ready for Christmas Eve because what which that was the the day <laughs> that he's going to be able to send out all the gifts to all the good little children around and all the families and hoping to get what they wish because he got a he had a huge job to do so that's why he didn't have time for the Christmas party with the rest so then Christmas morning came and that's where well, at first, uh, Susan felt a little disappointed because it's not exact. Because, well, she thought maybe he didn't. She didn't get what she wished. Well, at least that's what she thought. But then, much to the surprise, um, she received a note um, for Dor along with Doris, and then Fred, and then. And when they found out, they found out that there's a route that's um, being sent exactly what it's located. So now they had to drive over to um, the suburbs in New York. And by the time they spotted the for sale sign, that's exactly the house that she chose, that she wanted. And they finally got a Christmas miracle that that they were waiting to happen and yes this beautiful home also has a swing too and it has everything and under their names and their contracts I mean both uh, Doris and Chris were very surprised and at this rate <laughs> I, I'm sure they're, they're probably going to become a couple later on too but this is where it's it exclamates um, to his surprise that he is indeed Santa Claus that he really did send all this stuff and he was like wow <laughs> I can't believe it 
but at that rate, um, I guess they just weren't so sure once they spotted the cane <laughs> that's hidden between where the fireplace is at. I think maybe the person, so that's incredible. Yeah, and it's definitely the most miraculous um, holiday classic of them all for its cast, its crew, its, in, its joyful story. It's a feel-good movie, and it's the perfect film to watch uh, during the holiday season anytime. Uh, uh, Evan Grin as Chris Kringle was just magnificent in the role. I mean, he really, really took the guts and effort to play, you know, Santa, as we all know. And he can definitely shows that he has a good, kinded heart. And he's very gentle, for sure. He really cares for everyone. Yeah. And Maureen O'Hara, this is great to see a strong woman actually... You know, working as hard as she can to run, you know, the, the Macy's uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade and and also, you know, one of the, uh, one of her biggest jobs that she does at Macy's and does what she can to help assist as a uh, event director and does, even though she is a non-believer, I mean, she knows about truthful and common sense that she was doing, but, and I guess in that point on, I mean, she now believes. It kind of changes uh, the subject and how hard it takes for non-believers to believe in something. And it also helps Susan, too. Um, and Allie Wood is just uh, very cute and, and very uh you're beautiful as uh, Susan, and, and you know exactly what what she cares. I mean, despite of coming from her mom's side, that she's a non-believer too. Even though she wanted to, to question herself about about the myths of Santa Claus and fairy tales and all. And uh, Fred, John Payne as uh, Fred is just um, terrific. I'm definitely the perfect man to actually defend Chris and really cares for him so much because he believes in Santa, for sure. Um, now, there are a lot of great moments in the movie, too. Like, for example, when Susan was, was blowing out some bubble gum and then he let uh, Chris try it for sure, if she had a spare, and then all of a sudden... <laughs> He blew a huge bubble and then it got straight into his beard and he had trouble taking all the gum pieces out of it. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, or, or when um, Fred uh, took uh, Chris to his apartment and was telling him, you know, just a question that he was always wanted to ask about <laughs> how many riskers do you have and all. <laughs> yeah and so on and so forth and and yes uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, tender moments here and, and then there were and even though again there was a little bit of dark moments with you know having to being sent straight to the Bellevue Hospital like he thought he was going to give up. Like he wasn't. Like everyone's going to believe that you know, he isn't Santa at all. But no matter. But at least. You know, Fred helped him out. You know, relieved that problem. So now. You'll never feel disappointed. For all the rest of the crew and everyone. So no matter what what they can, they're always going to be a miracle that's going to save Christmas and also at 34th Street. Yeah. So anyway, 
Uh, for its budget, uh, it was only 630000 uh, but it actually made up to $2.7 million in U.S. rentals, for sure. But, of course, the film came out uh, in the late 40s. This was a, a different time. I'm sure it was a success when it came out, though, during that summer. So I know it, it did earn more. And I figured that um, at that point on, it, it, it became indeed a holiday favorite. Uh, got selected for preservation for the National Film Registry of Library of Congress, just like all the other films have been. And it's always going to stay strong no matter what. I mean, this is indeed the best Christmas movie ever made. And I always love to watch this, even during our Christmas time. And so is the rest of the families around. So that's Miracle on 34th Street. And I give the film five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later for this Christmas Day. Bye.